So we met when you punched me in the face. That's true. I was actually driving up from um, um, Los, Los Angeles. Angeles, San Francisco yesterday, and, and my wife actually said, hey, how do you know Jordan? Because mm -hmm. I've heard his name over the years. And I said, yeah, we met at a Muay Thai uh, uh, class in, in Los Angeles, and um, we were doing very light uh, sparring mm -hmm. and Jordan stepped into <laughs> one of my uh, stiff jabs. Yeah, yeah, I blocked a punch with my face and it was a remarkable amount of blood. Like the pain level was low, and I, but I still was like, something's definitely not right. And then to add insult to injury, my nose started bleeding everywhere. And of course, then the whole class has to stop like, oh, what happened? Well, I got punched in the face. So well, no, you, you stepped punch. into my punch. That's I true. didn't punch it. That's true. You just <laughs> held your fist out lightly, and I rammed my face into it as hard as I could. How many years ago? That, that's at least uh, 12, 12 years ago, I, 10 I years ago. I think it was probably about 10 years ago, yeah. maybe a little bit less, um, yeah. because I hadn't met my now wife, w mother of my 1.5 children, so it's, it's been a while. Yeah. Um, you grew up and came of age in South Africa in the 80s, 90s, what do you remember most about everyday life in, in apartheid South Africa? Well, uh, you know, I remember going to, to high school and then um, two days a week we had to wear cadet-style military uniforms, mm -hmm. uh, khaki shorts and uh, khaki uh, shirts, and we had to go and do drill marching on, on the rugby field and, you know, um, we learned songs, um, Why Are We Running, Swapu Swapu, which was a, a, a terrorist organization in, in, in Angola. Why are we running ANC, ANC? Because um, the propaganda they were feeding and instilling into us as the white youth of South Africa was that uh, there's something called Swart Gefaar. Uh, a black danger mm -hmm. and the Roy Gefaar, red danger. So um, they put it together and said the communist threat and the black threat was going to uh, rise up if we didn't be proactive and chase us all into the ocean. Wow. Okay, that's uh, that's scary when you're like 12. Totally. Yeah. Absolutely. So, you know, um, uh, when you have the, uh, that fed to you, it's it's... Uh, uh, the realization that, you know, I, I need to do something to protect myself. But the flip side of the coin was I'd go home and my parents, uh, um, you know, um, were, um, you know, very... Um, were they like hippies? They were like hippies, exactly. <laughs> okay. exactly. They, right. they, they were creatives. My mother was in the theater well, my dad was a uh, bespoke tailor of sorts, and, um, you know, they were very creative people. And uh, so I got home, and, um, you know, my f parents had black friends that would come and s sit on the... And that was rare, right? And, and that was rare in South Africa, because I'd go to another friend's house for a briar barbecue, and, um, you know, they'd be treating their staff terribly. And, uh, you know, the race, racist um, uh, ideology was, was pretty radical. Mm. So in your school growing up in South Africa in the 70s, there are no, like, black people or people of color in your school or anything? No, like no, no, not at all. Um, you know, growing up in South Africa, um, you know, um, the way the apartheid um, government had um, learned how to fortify themselves and def defend um, um, against, um, you know, the uprising of, of people of color, of black people. Mm -hmm. They actually got a lot of this from the Nazis playbook on how to, um, uh, protect themselves. For instance, uh, they created segregated communities, which were called townships. And for instance, the biggest one that, that most people will know about is Soweto, just outside. Yeah, I've heard of that. Yes, correct. Yeah. So just outside Joburg. And basically what they would do is have a, a, a big sort of wall around it and have one entrance in, one ent and an exit out. Um, you could use them to enter in and out of, but if there was upheaval or civil unrest in that area, they could block those two entrances 
and then fly over with Roy Falk helicopters and um, just take everybody out or whatever they needed to do. It's like a big concentration camp. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, obviously they needed to let, and, and, and they were strategically um, built in outside of, of white neighborhoods near it and they would build train tracks to them and so that, you know, we could still have our cushy lifestyles by or our privileged lifestyles by having our maid or housekeepers or gardeners jump on the train and then they would come to town. But they could only commute from the train station to my house, for instance, during a certain time. And they everybody had to have a passbook as well. So you couldn't walk around freely if you were a person of color in South wow. Africa. And that was violently enforced so you couldn't just be like a rebellious teenager and be like i'm not doing that shit and that you would get beat up by the cops or you would like get the life beat out of you you would get dogs put on you oh, wow. it was pretty gnarly i, I have a uh, example of the first time i sort of experienced that was when my um Folks had just come and picked me up from rugby practice as a youngster and we were driving down the road and my, my my father didn't like confrontation and conflict. My mother on the other side hmm. was a very uh, uh, um, assertive woman. She is a powerful woman. And uh, we were driving down the road and we saw this white guy beating this black guy up on the side of the road. And my mother said, stop the car, Herman. And dad said, honey, let's just keep going. We don't want to get involved. As we were driving by, we heard somebody scream, Mama Daff. My mom's name was Daphne. So mm. my mother grabbed the steering wheel, pulled it. Car went onto the side of the road. My mother jumped out of the car, and it was our gardener, Philemon, who was getting beat up by this, this white guy. And my mother jumped in there, shoved this white man um, off Philemon, picked Philemon up. Uh, and, and walked him to the car, put him in the back seat next to me, and Philemon's now crying, and he's got blood in his How face. How old is he? Uh, he was uh, 19, 20 oh, years okay. old. So he was like a kid, too. He was like a kid as well, so I put him in the car next to me. I'm completely shocked. I don't know what's going on, and he's crying. Herman, my dad's just saying, it's okay, Philemon. And I turn and I look through the back window of our old Peugeot, and um, I see my mother sticking her finger in his face. In the and, white guy's face. In the white guy's face. And I can hear her saying, uh, well, what's your problem? And um, the guy turned around and said, he hasn't got a passbook. So my mother said, you're not a police officer. Mm -hmm. And then the wife of this guy jumped out of the car, ran up to my mother and shoved my mother. My mother shoved her back. The guy moved forward towards my mother. And I remember my mother slapping him against the face and knocking this man down. My mother was a big lady. So um, <laughs> yeah. that's that's uh, um, how I was introduced to um, racism, I guess. So before that, you weren't really sure about, you, you, did, you just didn't think about it because you were too young? Well, uh, yes. And... Um, you know, like I said, uh, you know, we have had a privileged lifestyle mm -hmm. in South Africa. We lived behind um, these high walls with security systems, and we lived in this this almost like um, uh, a bubble or Stepford Wives kind of uh, society where uh, everything's picture perfect. But on right. on on the outskirts in the townships. Um, uh, you know, um, fires were going, uh, riots were going, uh, people were burning tires, etc. People were desperate. People were just trying to fight for their human rights. Now, tell me about, is it Stratum Square? I'm not going to get the R roll in there. But... Yeah, no, that's uh, Stratum Square. Yeah. Um, so, um, again, rugby, uh, 
my passion and my mm-hmm. my love. <laughs> um, I just finished rugby practice. My mother worked at the State Theatre, which was the National Theatre in South Africa, and we were going to go see the opening of Giselle, the ballet, that night. I'd caught the train, so I had my rugby kit bag with my... Uh, um, tuxedo in in folded nicely in my rugby kit bag and I was listening to my Walkman walking down the street and um you know during business hours you know there's all different walks of life so um, white people black people everybody's walking along the streets and there's this one particular place on Stratum Square where people get to sit and eat and have their lunch etc and uh, I was just crossing over Stratum Square to go to the State Theatre. Um, and um, all of a sudden, I heard two loud cracks. And um, I knew they were gunshots because, you know, recreationally, we used to go target shoot. And mm-hmm. and, um, and all of a sudden, I saw the sea of chaos of people just scattering and running everywhere. And I saw these people, black people running towards me with um, their eyes as big as saucers and, and the complete and utter fear and terror, the look of fear and terror on their faces. And, um, you know, then I saw in the distance this tall, skinny guy with camouflage fatigues. And I thought, oh, maybe... Uh, he's a security um, uh, task force guy, which was the uh, domestic counterterrorism unit in South Africa. Maybe there's an incident and he's catching some bad people. And then I saw him walk up to this um, uh, heavy set black lady that was carrying some grocery bags and he shot her execution style. And that's when... Um, I came to the realization that, you know, this, this person was evil and this person was out to, to hurt people. He, um, he then turned into this little garden area, which had this little pathway with little benches. And, um, I, I ran up to a wall that sort of surrounded this garden Mm -hmm. because I wanted to see, you know, what was going on. Um, You know, I was 17 and, um, you know, I thought I was a tough guy. And uh, so I, I, I hid behind this wall and I stuck my head over the wall and I saw him shoot somebody else. And then at that point I heard somebody go, Hey, hey, clang boss, which means little boss. And I turned around and I saw this uh, young black guy with with kind eyes. I call him kind eyes. Gesture me over and call me over. So I went and I hid behind a bench with him. He was taking cover behind a bench. And there were a few other people behind that bench um, hiding and, and, and taking cover and somebody jumped up from that bench and ran away. And as soon as they did that, that guy with the camouflage turned around and started shooting in our direction. And I can still remember the, it was a marble bench, the shards from the ricochet from the marble bench still hitting the back of my neck and stinging the back of my neck. Like pieces of marble? Like pieces of, of, exactly, like pieces of marble. And it's just, it's it's one of these memories that I've just carried with Mm -hmm. me uh, for so long. And then um, um, Kind Eyes and I looked over the bench again and um, and we saw him shoot somebody else. And I think something snapped in Kind Eyes and he jumped up and he rushed towards the sky while his back was towards us. And I picked up my rugby kit bag and I followed him to try and see if I could maybe help. Mm -hmm. And um, as I turned around this corner of of that little uh, wall, the low wall and the bushes in that garden, I heard two shots. And... um, this guy in the camera had shot kind eyes twice. I uh, ran towards kind eyes. The guy with the camera saw me running towards him. He raised the gun in my direction. 
and then hesitated and saw I was white and lowered the gun. I got down on my knees. I picked Kind Eyes' head up and I put it on my lap and I saw he was struggling to breathe and um, I, 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 did, I, I needed to try and stop the blood. So I saw blood squirting and I stuck my fingers in his mm -hmm. bullet holes because I didn't know what else to do, but I thought that made sense. And I turned up to him and I said, why are you doing this? And he said, I do that for the tukoms for wit South Afrikaners, mm -hmm. which means I'm doing this for the future of white South Africans. Uh, he turned around and, and he jogged off a brave um, um, black guy that was a taxi driver, followed him later, distracted him, took his gun away from him. And they overpowered him and arrested him. Oh, wow. Him. That's a gutsy move. Right oh, there. yeah, big time. And um, But that incident was on the Stratum Square on the 15th of November, 1988. And um, the guy in the camouflage, his name is Barnt Hendrik Stratum. Um, he calls himself Die Wit Wolf. He was a failed police officer that got fired from... Um, the South African police for actually posing uh, in a photograph with a uh, decapitated black man's head. So he's a so sick psycho. Obviously. Sick psycho, but uh, his father was in the the AWB, which which is the right. It's like the Nazi Party in in you know in Germany. Uh, it's called the Afrikaner Weerstand Bewegung. The, the um, Africana resistance movement, mm. and they um, they were a militant right wing organization. So he, what I learned from that is um, racism is taught. Mm -hmm. You know, races you aren't born a racist. So you know, because if I look at he could have been my brother, that guy. You know, we yeah. looked similar. We blonde. You know, he he was a few years older than me, and. Um, you know, but my parents taught me kindness and humanity, and his parents taught him hatred. And and I know your mom later found you with like a whistle. She whistled for That's you. That's right. Yes. So um, while I was sitting there, and and there's a famous photo in South Africa, which was on the front page of the newspaper, with Kind Eyes's head on my lap, and my mother was up in the state theater, um, looking down with with some of the ballet dancers, they were looking at the chaos and I think she saw me from the top. She went downstairs and she started running and she we have had this family whistle that went and I heard her and I was like, oh, it's like the God. Hunger Games kind of. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thank God my mother's here and she doesn't take no bullshit. So, yeah. yeah. Do you t did you teach the family whistle to your daughter? Yes, actually. Yeah. It's I kind did. of a good idea. I think, yeah. Jen, Jen, let's get a family whistle. Make it write that down. <laughs> well, uh, we might use the hunger, some takeoff of the Hunger Games yeah. uh, whistle. So, so this this screwed you up, right? This was this was like a, you had PTSD, nightmares. You were an angry kid by all accounts. You didn't really do so well in school after that. Correct. Yeah, yeah. I. Um... I've I've only really been able to tell this story um, only in the last uh, ten or fifteen years, uh, because it was just so hard for me to talk about this. I I it, it 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 still obviously um, messes with me, but I've 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 had a lot of closure since mm. then. I actually got a lot of closure um, in 2018 when I went back to South Africa uh, with a documentary film crew and um, uh, actually for the first time opened up those old dossiers and old files that hadn't been opened up since the late 80s. I still remember opening up these and the paper was brown and still crinkly. Like police files or police something? Police files, okay. yeah. Police files and reports to figure out what the names were of those people that died on on the square that day. So, oh, right. Uh, because maybe it, it seems like 
We see this uh, a lot where the victims' names aren't mentioned, especially if they're considered less important by the society that they're that, that they've been in, right? Exactly. And it, it it even went as far as me finding photographs, and you know, it it, it just shows the 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 mindset of the apartheid um, or the national party governments. Um, a way of handling and dealing with the deceased. For instance, there were some people that were on these um, still gurney type of things in the morgue, and then there were other people that were half lying on the floor. Mm. Um, they just sort of discarded them Discard. and didn't care about them much just because of the color of their skin. Yeah, I mean, the whole regime was set up that way. Yes, exactly. Obviously. And there probably wasn't a whole hell of a lot of counseling back, that grief counseling for somebody who's... Your, who was your age back in South Africa? Yeah, you know, uh, and 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 that's the biggest problem with with uh, a PTSD or, or, or mental illness is you know, especially in a um, uh, um, a society like a like South African society where you know we had one of the most powerful and strongest military forces. In the world, for a small country like huh. that, we developed seven atomic bombs. So, you know, um, um, our special forces back then, the Reckies, uh, you, you know, um, were on the same par as the British SAS or, you know, the Navy SEALs kind of thing. Who trained them? Was it the United States and Britain? Um, the, the British. The yeah. British, you know, were, were, were involved in that and the former Rhodesian Salu Scouts were involved with training. Uh, but South Africa was a, a, a military, a very powerful military force. But my point is, is that, you know, the, 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 the male society will just, you know, slap you on the back and say, you know, pull yourself towards yourself. Mm -hmm. Get your shit together. Stop being such a wuss. You know, uh, get over it. You know, it's so. So that's that's the uh, sort of mentality and societal uh, um, band aid mm -hmm. uh, for, for for dealing with something back then. But my parents obviously uh, sent me for therapy. Um, but I was so distracted and I was so angry and confused. Uh, you know, I couldn't really focus. Yeah. The problem is, you know, my therapist at the time was gorgeous and I, <laughs> and you know, being a young boy with yeah. your hormones rising <laughs> too, I couldn't concentrate. Right. So it, it just sort of, you know, that was a, a poor choice. They should have given you like a old dude. Exactly. Old dude. <laughs> exactly. Like, Focus, man. Exactly. Oh, I'm focused. All right. Um, so your mom and or your parents enlist you in the mil military at this point, right? They throw you in the navy. Yeah, because I struggled at school. Now you know, I I I, I excelled at rugby. I did great at rugby because mm -hmm. it's a contact physical sport where I could get rid of my frustrations. But you know, I struggled at school with discipline after that. You yeah. know, and I'd constantly be getting into fights and. Uh, not taking uh, orders very well from teachers, and I punched my woodwork teacher, and you know, jeez, yeah, that's a, that's a pretty, that's a low stress subject in school, I would imagine. <laughs> like of all the teachers to get frustrated with, woodworking not at the top of my list. Exactly, because um, and and the reason uh, you, you know why I punched him was in South Africa you get a rule. There's a rule, they, they'll cane you because we used to get caned at school. So, oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, but you cannot get more than six cane canings a day. So there was a limit to <laughs> six canings a day. Okay. And my, my, I, I, won't, I won't even ask why, because the whole thing is just nonsense. I guess at some point you're doing more damage with the cane or it's I, just... I have no idea, but you know, I, I was so broken after the stage, my, my, Woodwork teacher gave me six canes and I turned around and I said, is that all you, all you got? And he gave me another cane. Mm. So now he had broken the law and I turned around and I just popped him on the jaw, yes. ran to the bicycle shed, got on my BMX and rode home. Jeez. Thank God I didn't get expelled because yeah. my dad was the head of the parents teachers association oh yeah model child you were hey i need to call in a favor my kid knocked out the woodworking teacher exactly jeez so yeah. okay so you belonged in the military yeah definitely. so my, my my parents um i was supposed to go out to palaboa infantry to the army but um 
that was going to be my call up because in South Africa, there's a national um, compulsory uh, service. Correct. So there's national compulsory service uh, similar to Israel. So uh, my call up papers were for, for an intra, intra, uh, infantry division up in Palaboa, which is up north in the country. But um, we then changed and I joined the permanent force and I joined the South African Navy. So uh, I got put on a train and um, I got sent down to to uh, um, Soldana, which is the basic training camp for the Navy. And I excelled there and I did well there, actually. You, you mentioned in the book that you, you were, uh, there were like fake Russian fishing boats. What are, What's that all about? That was kind of interesting. Yeah, so, um, you know, after the fall of, the Berlin Wall and after the Cold War and the CIA's war with uh, the KGB, the emphasis now switched to sub-Saharan Africa because of the incredible uh, mineral resources and um, because of uh, the idealism that, uh, a socialist idealism that, that, could be ingrained into um, a desperate population, being the black population mm -hmm. in South Africa that were oppressed. So um, um, the KGB had started an alliance, or the Russians had started an alliance with uh, Nelson Mandela's freedom uh, um uh, a freedom fighter movement, the African National Congress, specifically within Mkonto Wesizwe, which means the spear of the nation. Mm -hmm. So the Russians were giving training and uh, um, aid to to this. Um, back then, it was still seen as a terrorist organization mm -hmm. to the African National Congress. So during the Navy, there were uh, uh, Russian trawlers off the coast um, communicating secretly to small communication hubs within the townships. They'd given them um, equipment, et cetera. So, you know, that's, that's part of that um, clandestine warfare mm -hmm. that was you, going on. White people didn't go into the townships, I assume, for any reason. N uh, no. No, for the most part, um, the only people that you would find in the townships were uh, policemen uh, with their dogs or with their, uh, what we call as a shambok. It's a big, long plastic uh, a whip kind of a whip? thing. A whip? A whip. Well, it's, it's, it's... Like a fiberglass stick? It's it's almost like a fiberglass stick. Or if you, if, but it whips. If, it's if, if you take a black plastic trash can and you melt it into a long um, stick type of thing, mm -hmm. thick in the bottom, thin on the top. That's what they used to beat uh, 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 people within, black people within South Africa and do riot control. Oh, I feel like I've seen those in the video. You ever see those videos where in India there's a curfew for COVID and if you're caught out, the police are just hitting you with this like plastic thing? Exactly. And it looks like a rubber hose kind of deal? It, yeah. Exactly. So it's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, nasty. Yeah. So those are the, so you don't you don't go to the township because there's a great soul food restaurant or whatever in the area. No. Or a good bar. No. It's no. A, some some kids would go and buy some some uh, Durban poison or Malawi gold, go buy some uh, flour or, or marijuana in the townships. Mm. But for the most part, I I remember sneaking into the township in my teens to go buy a uh, beer because yeah. you know we could go to the legal bars and. Uh, buy beer, but um, the only reason I did that was because um, the lady that worked for us, her son, um, later on had one of these, and um, oh, so he could. I had an in. I had safe passage. You had the hookup. The yeah, <laughs> jeez. Okay, so you're in the military, and you get stationed. Was it in Angola or near Angola? Uh, no, I was. Um, I went to Angola for a while. and That was later, though, right? Yes. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what's going on in Angola in this time? Because all, all people really know about Angola, generally in the United States, is shitload of landmines, civil war, insurgency. 
And if that's if they even know diamonds what. and oil, right? Diamonds and oil. Okay. So, uh, y- you know, the biggest tank battle in the history of the world actually happened in, in Angola. Um, the uh, CIA were very active in, a- in Angola, as were the Cubans. The Cubans came and gave support, military support, um, to the to the Cubans and to the Angolans, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, to the Angolans, and and that was uh, called the Bush War, and uh, it was a n- nasty war, and um, you know uh, the craziest battles that that were fought, fought, and um, you know uh, a, a lot of white South Africans that didn't believe in um, apartheid and didn't believe in uh, joining the South Af- or, or uh, doing um, um, military service for the South African government, they had to leave. So they'd go to the United States or they'd go to a- England, for instance, because they'd be arrested if, if um, like know. draft dodging. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So, um, you know, uh, uh, th- so that's what was going on there because of the incredible natural resources that there are, mm-hmm. um, specifically oil and and diamonds. Angola is an incredibly rich place for that, and um, the Angolans were also giving refuge to Nelson Mandela's uh, political freedom fighters within the African National Congress. And this is like a Cold War relic type situation, right? It's like there were communists and there was the UNITA insurgency that was funded by CIA, probably South African uh, military, so South African Defense Force. So this is just like a nasty, dirty civil war that's sort of pretending to be communist, very anti-communist, but is really just about natural resources. Probably, right? Ultimately. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you get booted out of the army for assaulting an officer, as should, which should surprise no one. And then uh, and then you become a bouncer in a gay club, as one does, right? After being a badass <laughs> dude, you know, hey, let's... Well, uh... well, well if I could just say, my, my father just had a, uh, um, a heart attack, and my base commander would not allow me to go see my father. Right, this is a shitty, shitty move. Yeah, exactly. So you know, I was uh, I was really upset. So so because um, I was very close to my old man, uh, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, so I did get. Uh, I actually got honorably discharged from the South African Navy. Yeah, so you knocked him out, but you did it for a good reason. It, but still, get the hell out of exactly. Here. Yeah. But you know, I was. It, it, Again, PTSD. I was mm-hmm. very conflicted. I was very depressed. Um, you know, I, 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 I thought about suicide at that stage. You know, things were. I had this big gray cloud following me mm-hmm. constantly, and um, um, you know, my I had this very short fuse. So things things weren't working out well mm-hmm. for me, and my godfather that my mother knew from from the theater. Um, had a boyfriend that had a gay club in Cape Town. Mm. And I didn't know what to do. I needed to make some money. And the the conservative South African uh, society r- really shunned the gay community at that stage as well. They were incredibly religious and uh, very conservative. And um, so, you know, I got a job as a bouncer at a gay club called mm-hmm. Blondes. Blondes, yeah, that's blondes. a very gay club, gay, gay club exactly. name. Yeah, and they had this uh, big blonde kid at the door. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Well, well, there's 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 a lot we could dive in there, but I'm gonna resist the urge because it is it's just a funny sort of juxtaposition. Like it's big tough guy, ex military. Like all right, we'll put him at the front door. Good advertising. Um, it, but it's also like your mom's friend, uh, friend's boyfriend. It's just a. It seems like this weird sort of glamorous turn for a guy that had a rough upbringing um and now look this is sort of nearing the end of apartheid right yes correct okay. yeah so uh so, so basically what happened was i was actually working at at blondes at the door and um um there's a a, a local transvestite her name was coco um, she had just walked up the stairs and she was leaving. She gave me a peck on the cheek and walked down the street. And then 
uh, a few minutes later, one of the little uh, black uh, street kids, which I call Twilight Kids, came running up to the door and said, um, Uncle Brad, Uncle Brad, um, Miss Coco, they're hurting Miss Coco. So I ran around the corner. And as I ran around the corner, I didn't know this at the time, but a car had pulled up to a um, a corner store called Cadiz on the, uh, on the corner in Cape Town. Out of that car stepped a guy called Neil De Beer. Inside that car was the head of the security police in the Western Cape, a high-ranking member of the security police in the Western Cape called Major Andy Miller. And they were in the car. Fast forward, I'm running down the street with the Twilight Kid to go and find these guys that are beating Coco up. I get there and there's these two uh, white Africana concert conservative guys thought Coco was a girl. They found out that Coco was a transvestite and um, started beating her up. Mm. So I just let loose and, um, you know, beat the hell out of these guys. And um, the major was sitting in the car, um, apparently saw me through the window when Neil De Beer got in back into the car with his gunston smokes. He went to buy him smokes. The ma- uh, uh, the major said, "I want, I want that guy. Go and recruit him. Get mm-hmm. him, get him to come and work with us." Um, so yeah, that's how I ended up um, uh, joining the security police. Um, so this this SB security branch or whatever. Yeah. What, give us a picture of what this is because it's not. It's it's not the FBI, it's not the CIA, it's it's the inf- it's it's a combination of 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 the two, I guess, but it's the uh, enforcement arm of the intelligence community. But still, remember, folks, the apartheid government, right? So they're kind Correct. of like doing shady shit. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's where all the black ops. Uh, um, and and gray ops, all that stuff happens mm-hmm. um, um, through the security police. It's a little bit like the Stasi, right? The East German exactly. Stasi. Okay. Yeah, that's 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 spot on. So at the time, um, Neil De Beer approached me, and I knew who who he was because he had recently started this outfit called Project Group. But I thought Project Group was just a a security company that used to take care of nightclubs and take care of international guests coming into the country and mm-hmm. security, et cetera. But I didn't know that it was a, a proxy front for um, for the security branch. Okay, so they're kind of doing off-the-book stuff for the security branch. And they send you to find this this wep- this like uh well they I don't even think you knew at the time you That's ended right. up finding this Soviet weapons cache. That's it's like right. a bathtub full of grenades basically and guns is kind of how it sounds. Yeah, so stinky uh, guns. Exactly. What, you said it smelled. That was the part that was confusing. Like how do the where do the guns smell? Well, the the the, the whole operation smelt. It was off. The whole thing was dodgy. Oh, you didn't mean. Oh, I thought you meant they literally smell. No, 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 no. Okay. The, 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 in the, the book, it's a little unclear. It yeah. sounds like it smells in the bathroom yeah, where you yeah, found yeah. the guns. Uh, w- w- one of the first operations that that uh, we were involved with, well, not one of the first, actually a, a, a ways into it. Um, at this stage now, I get to finally meet Major Miller. I get to sort of understand that you know, we're actually doing work for the government. So um, don't be concerned, Bradley. Uh, we've got your back. Right. And it's all on the up and up. It's don't all worry on about the, the up grenades and up. you found. Yeah. E- exactly. But we didn't know that, that there was a cache of arms. He told us to go and retrieve classified documents mm. um, from a safe house. Um, that the African National Congress, Mandela's uh, uh, politi- oh, party was was um, um, harboring there. Okay. And um, we went and we got the docks. We put the docks into this uh, 7 Series BM and we sent it up to uh, Johannesburg, 12 hours drive. And um, then uh, we went into this, this bathroom uh, in the staff quarters, 
which was locked. We broke in, we got in there, and we found a cache of uh, Russian-made RPGs, hand grenades, uh, wow. AK-47s, a ton of ammunition, etc. So, um, you know, I, I, I guess it Major Miller told us that that stuff was there. We perhaps wouldn't have gone in there and... Uh, done the operation but because um, you would be worried that the, you would get shot if you went in there if they had ak-47 well, well, right? well just that the um um that the risk of the operation is a lot higher correct yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay so but the, the the interesting thing is is that um major miller got this intel from from the cia the CIA told him that there's a secret cache of arms that could potentially shoot an airliner down, and they were located right next to Cape Town International Airport. Oh, so you're so they thinking... they would have shot a bird out of the sky straight from the backyard of this um, industrial office. Right, yeah, you're you're thinking, like, this, they're going to blow a passenger plane down, and it's going to be a huge terrorist incident. Exactly. And was that the plan, or was that... That, that ultimately was the plan. Oh, that's here. Yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we ended up now... Getting so Neil the Beer and myself keep this part away from the four other guys that are on this this op, ops with us. We send those other guys with the Twilight Kids that we were using as lookouts. We send them all away. Everybody's gone now. We take this cache of arms. We load it into the back of uh, a vehicle. And then we uh, need to obviously hide it somewhere. Yeah, now. what do you need so, to keep it so in the garage? So what do we do? So exactly, do we just take it to <laughs> yeah, public put storage? Put it in my mom's house. <laughs> exactly. Put it in my aunt's house. Yeah, hey, my car's attic. giving me some problems. The clutch is not working. Can I leave it there? No. So I decide to take it to my old Navy base because I know it's on a secure Navy base. They're just not, they're, they're not going to ask any questions if you show up with a trunk full of weapons. Well, they're not going to know there's a trunk full of weapons in there. So I had a mate that was at a barracks. Uh, it, it had a, a medium to high security uh, presence at the barracks. Um, my mate walked us straight in. We drove the car in and I left the car there until we figured out what plan B was. Oh, okay. I would like to think that it's not that easy to do that here in the United States, but I just don't know. Like, nothing surprises me anymore. But it seems like they should have been, there should have been a little more oversight as to what's in the trunk of the car that you're going to park in the base. Well, uh, I, I guess so, 100%, yeah. but not when not when your mates are, you know, running the security yeah. um, for that, yeah. And, so. and at this time, you're, you're running these little side, sort of side missions, right? And one of them was you put a grenade or a fake, fake grenade in someone's wife's purse. You wanted to intimidate them, so she found the grenade and freaked out, obviously. And you take, you break into houses, take photos of yourselves with masks on, with people's pets to show them that you can get to their house. Uh, you spiked someone's toothbrush with LSD to get them to open up during an interrogation. Is that accurate? Uh, no, not to open up during an interrogation, but rather just to psychologically. Oh, just psycho to scare them. Just to scare them. Because I guess if you didn't know you were on LSD, you would just think you're having a mental breakdown. Exactly. That's somehow worse. But I mean, is it weird talking about this knowing? you know, your daughter's going to read this book because I'm kind of imagining, you know, well, honey, daddy used to be a bad man and punch people in the face for money. And, you know, now that's how daddy makes friends, right? I mean, it's just kind of a weird uh, thing to put all out there. It's vulnerable to put that in there. Your wife's going to read this. Maybe she already knows. No, and, and she does. But, um, you know, the, the circle that my life has taken... Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, there there are bad things that need to be done in this world and, mm -hmm. and some people that just need to do that stuff. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not proud of a lot of the things that I've done, but, you know, it's, it's my, my, my biggest mission in life at the moment is, is to try and uh, for instance, in my homeland, South Africa, and that's why I'm actually on my way back to South Africa, moving back to South Africa after being away for so many years, 
is uh, twenty five years, right? Twenty five years <laughs> is 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 to fight for change and 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 to uh, um, expose uh, what we discovered. Mm -hmm. And this is a good way to to sort of segment into what that was. And is the book selling well in South Africa? The book was a bestseller for six months okay, in good. South Africa. Because you never know. Like, people could go, I don't like this at all. Right? Yeah, this yeah, is terrible. Yeah. I don't want to hear about this. So it was released in 2019, and it stayed a bestseller for six months. So apparently that's pretty good. Yeah, so, that sounds pretty good. I mean, yeah. just hitting any list is, is good. Staying yeah, there for yeah. half a year is... So no, it was, uh, it was number one um, for, um, I think, for a month or two. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, it stayed on the top 10 for six months, which is That's great. unheard of from what I understand. So You had some other areas where you drew the line, right? You were sent to poison someone, and then you replaced the poison with another product, which I guess that was a little confusing in the book, but it sounds like you went to the store. If the poison looks like Cheerios, you bought some Fruit Loops, and you replaced the, you sort of switched it up so that you're, whoever you were working with thought you were going to poison this person. Yeah, so so that's towards the the end of the book. Um, um, but but maybe it, if we can just take a step back. Yeah, and, we'll step uh, back. Yeah, yeah. Let's just I, take a, for the by the way for those who uh, don't know what Fruit Loops are. Fruit Loops is a cereal with a bunch of different colors in it that which are all mixed yeah. together. Pretty much the opposite of apartheid South Africa, actually. Exactly. So, yeah. but I I basically swapped out um, rice and with caster sugar. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like a a form of a sweetener sugar mm -hmm. kind of here yeah, to avoid um, the poisoning of. Um, Hamans, the the water supply to Hamans Kral, which is a a um, a segregated black township. They were going to poison everyone in the whole township. They were going to oh, poison. So this is like a terrorist by. attack. Yes. Oh, that's horrible. Yeah. But uh, and and that was by uh, Wham, the World Apartheid Movement, which is sort of like a neo-Nazi party. Which which. They were involved for the political killings, a, a few political killings and stuff. Gotcha. Like okay. So there's links to them uh, being behind the assassination of our um, our Che Guevara, which was our commander, Chris Hani. So I, 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 I'm getting... Yeah, we're getting. We, we, I screwed up the the uh, the linear time thing here, and I jumped ahead. Exactly. I had that note on a post-it, and I put it in my notes, and I put it in the wrong place. But that's what you get when you read a bunch of different sources, including a book, right? Yeah. But there's so much. There's so much in the news about this as well, right? That, first of all, the taxi wars. This is a little bit of a, a non sequitur. It's a little bit of an aside, but this is insane. So when I heard taxi wars, I thought, oh well, you know, we have Lyft, we have Uber. They're competing. They're always doing different <laughs> coupons and prices. That is not what the taxi wars are. This is, that is not the same thing. No, no. It's basically, uh, if if you think about it from an American point of view, if you think of Jimmy Hoffa mm -hmm. and the unions. So the taxis were, were uh, uh, unions in South Africa, but um, the apartheid government, um, uh, you know, used to politicize it and, and fuel it. Um, uh, with with racism between these uh, different tribes, etc. Because South Africa is a fascinating country. It has eleven official languages. It has a few different, uh, um, very powerful uh, uh, cultural tribes. For instance, the Zulus, Zulu, yeah, which Saka Zulus, the uh, um, uh, former king and the the descendant of the Zulu nation, is the powerful uh, a war type nation and 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 that's where the local civil unrest in South Africa that's just occurred now in the month of July 2021 has has sparked uh, a, a massive uh, amount of civil unrest across South Africa because um, one of the most corrupt um, members of the South African government, former members of the South African government and former president Jacob Zuma Mshulozi, um, you know, is, is supposed to be standing for trial at our constitutional court, but um, he has been charged with contempt of court mm -hmm. and refused to go to jail. Right. And 
now the whole country's on fire. Yeah, he did. I guess he turned out to be kind of a disappointment. Uh, that we could talk about that over lunch. This is a totally separate topic, I guess. Exactly. Um, yeah. So th the taxi wars, this sort of sounds like, okay, it's the only way for a lot of black people in the country at this time to make any money because it's one of the only sort of enterprises where they can operate. And then rival taxi cartels are beating up passengers and beating up the drivers of the others and even killing them, which is an interesting way to get business. Uh, like all jokes aside, you could be riding in it. Like, imagine if you're riding in a lift and an Uber driver like cuts you off, pulls you out of the car, beats your ass and says, don't ever take a lift again, always take an Uber, and then speeds off, leaving you like bloodied in the road. That's kind of what we're talking about, right? Absolutely, 100%, yeah. And there's like, they're cutting, bombing, stabbing, shooting people on trains because they want them to not take the train and then take private taxis to raise the profit margin. So again, think you, you're driving an Uber and they hijack your bus and they say, don't ever take the bus, take a private, take Uber. Correct. This is Correct. crazy. Correct, yeah. Um, what are you doing during this mess? Because you, you had a job or a role in, the, in, in these kind of situations. So at, at that stage, um, the security police and Major Miller were in bed with the South African Black Taxi Association, SAPTA. And SAPTA had recently just um, assassinated uh, the head of CODETA, which was a rival taxi organization. And Major Miller needed his asset protected and, and kept safe. So um, we were tasked with protecting him. And um, uh, that's when I got shot for the first time. For so the first time, okay. The... Um, we got ambushed uh, uh, near the Golden Acre Center in Cape Town. Is that like a mall? Uh, exactly. Okay. It's, exactly. So it's a mall that has a taxi rank outside. And um, we were driving in a secure convoy to go pick up the head of SAPTA's um, daughter. And um, we came under gunfire. But, you know, we hadn't... Uh, received our um, R1 automatic rifles. We only had nine mils and thirty eight revolvers and uh, so hand three five handguns mm -hmm. with us. And um, we came into a contact situation and uh, we lost my driver. My driver was shot. Um, I took the principal, um, pulled him out of the vehicle uh, to get him into our backup vehicle. And we were hiding behind the wheel well. Uh, and um, we were taking fire from an AK-47. So n note to self, never go to a gun battle uh, against an AK-47 with a pistol. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's kind it's, of it's, the knife and the gunfight almost. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, um, so um, my client tried to jump up, run away. So he just panicked. He panicked. Yeah. I had to grab him. I had to pistol whip him, hit him on the back of the head, tell him to sit down. I had to sit on top of him. Um, uh, I still remember he ended up pissing his pants because of a giant wet patch. Right. Um, you know, it, it was a terrifying situation, but we managed to get out. And then uh, when we got back to a safe house, I remember my fingers were sticking together and I saw I had some blood on my hands. And I looked up and I... Um, and I had part of a, um, a round lodged into my bicep. So it missed my heart only by a few inches. Wow. So, um, yeah, that was uh, uh, pretty scary. Jeez, wow. So, so that was still working for, for uh, Major Andy Miller. Um, after that, he instructed us to um, go and extract and go and kidnap or go and grab this guy right uh, wow it's called Stephen kamala and we'll get there in a second okay there is by the way for those who are listening there is a twist in this plot i'm not just interviewing terrible people now now i know this kind of stuff can be difficult to hear believe me i understand but we have a lot of podcasts on all kinds of topics like this one if you're into serious stuff but we have shows on lighter topics too emmy nominated comedians billionaire investors fortune 500 ceos and, of course, organized crime figures, legendary Hollywood directors, Russian spies, arms traffickers, undercover agents, rocket scientists, neuroscientists, and more. So check out The Jordan Harbinger Show anywhere you find your podcasts. Now, back to the show. 
you, you say in the book, I can find multiple ways to justify it if I choose, but the fact is that Project Group, your thug bodyguard group, was doing the donkey work of an organization that embraced racist, psychotic killers. So this is like, you're doing bad stuff, but you're still kind of a lost soul. And then soon after, Nelson Mandela gets out of prison. He's the ANC leader. A lot of, a lot of people watching probably are too young to know, which is interesting. And a lot of people are very aware of who that is. Uh, largely seen as a freedom fighter in South Africa. Tell me how you meet this guy, Kumalo. So Major Andy Miller... Um, Your boss in the secret police. I, I, our boss in the, in the security police um, uh, gives us a dossier. Inside of this dossier is a profile of a guy called Stephen Kumalo, which is an alias. Uh, Stephen Kumalo has, is a highly, highly trained, Stephen Kumalo is a highly trained operative um, um, of South African descent. Uh, he's had his training done by the KGB in Moscow. He's currently in uh, Lusaka, uh, where all military operations take place. Um, outside South Africa. Is that in Angola? Uh, uh, Zambia. Zambia. Yeah, okay. in, in Zambia. And um, and um, so I, I, I'll, I'll um, orders are to try and track him down, find him, bring him in, and, um, and gather information mm -hmm. out of him and figure out what the African National Congress his new pushes because he's a highly placed secret asset. Um, and, you know, he's uh, high, highly placed um, with the KGB or with, with the um, former KGB. And um, he ends up, um, funnily enough, crossing the, um, a river and um, coming into South Africa uh, with a pocket full of rough diamonds. And um, we figure out where he is. We go kick the door down. The whole shack falls down as we kick the door down. So this is like made out of corrugated metal. Exactly. It's literally a little shack, like a exactly. shanty town type. Exactly. Shack. It's made out of old billboards and road signs and it's a shanty town shack kick the door down. His wife tries to scratch my eyes out. We grab him. There's a kid standing outside the door that hears the commotion with a panga that wants to try and... What's that, a machete? A machete, exactly. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I remember shouting, fuck off, because, you know, she's a young kid. Nobody needed to die that day. We just needed to get him in the van and take him to a safe house an hour north of Pretoria in a place called Warm Baths on a, on a rural farm that the security police used for interrogations. So we grabbed him, we took him, uh, we, he's sitting at a table. Um, I'm waiting for Neil the Beer to come into the office and I'm standing against the wall with my arms crossed and he said, Baba, I can see you're a big guy, you're a strong guy, I can see you can hurt me, I can see you want to hurt me, you want to inflict pain on me. But before you do that, I want to tell you about the African National Congress's Freedom Charter and what it stands for, and that it includes you and your tribe, because we see the white South Africans and the Afrikaners as part of one of the African tribes now. So the Freedom Charter stands for all South Africans. Something resonated within him. I don't know if it was, he reminded me of kind eyes, but all of a sudden the fog and all this confusion in my, from the PTSD from being so angry sort of subsided. It was my coming to Jesus moment mm -hmm. or when the penny dropped. And I realized that, you know, this is not about the, for me, it's never really been black danger mm -hmm. because I grew up in an incredible liberal family. 
for me, it was about the communist threat, mm-hmm. the Roy Gefar, red danger. And all of a sudden, this just my, I, my, 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 my whole mindset changed. And I stepped out and I said to Neil, Neil, just come and listen to this for a second. And uh, he said, you're not going soft on me, right? And I said, no, we need to be smart here. You need to come and listen to this. And he told Neil as well. He said, our Freedom Charter is is there to protect all South Africans. Mm -hmm. And that was a very, very powerful uh, uh, statement. And it's a very powerful document. And... um, Neil and I stepped out again and we were like, what is happening here? And, you know, um, uh, we were incredibly moved by the situation. So we decided to um, not beat him up, not torture him, not hurt him. Um, I remember taking a, a, a knife and cutting myself and uh, taking the blood and putting it on Kumalo's face. And um, uh, we took some photos so that we could show the major. And we told the major that we had um, secured him as an asset Mm -hmm. for us and for the security police so that he would now become our informant and he would give us information. Neil and I, at that stage, decided that uh, we would stay in communication with him, that we would have a weekly time, that we would call him at an allocated payphone and check in with each Mm -hmm. other. And um, if we needed to meet, we could meet covertly somewhere. And... um, But in essence, that's when Neil and I decided to switch and become double agents. By the way, Afrikaans sounds a little bit like you speak German, but you're just really drunk and everything is slurring. <laughs> Can you understand a little bit yeah, of German? Yeah, I assume? Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, ich kann kleine Deutsch versprechen, aber yeah. nicht so viel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, I can speak a little bit of German, but not too yeah, much. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it sounds a little bit But it's a similar. Dutch, an, it, it's, sure. it's an ancient Dutch dialect, yeah. yeah. So, um, okay, so you meet him by kidnapping him. You met me by punching me in the face. I'm starting to wonder if this is how you make all of your friends. <laughs> I, how did you meet your wife? Did you run her over with your car? <laughs> no, I picked her up in a bar. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Okay, so now you're a double agent. So, in, in essence, yes. So, um, now, this this was an incredible stressful time in in, in, in my life because... Uh, you know, if if Major Miller found out or or the security police found out, it'd be very easy for them to put a nine miller back behind my ear and 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 squeeze the trigger and kill us. And uh, you know, life is very cheap in Africa. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, that could happen like that. And I wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even see it coming. Mm-hmm. Um so, you know, we had to play a a a, a a very careful, balanced uh, um, operation because every time we had come into contact with Major Miller now, um, you know, this guy was was a highly trained intelligence operative and, uh, you know, he could smell a, a, a rat a mile away. So, you know, we had to be incredibly careful. We had to make sure and rehearse everything before we said anything to him to make sure that we don't get caught in a lie mm-hmm. because then it's tickets. He just, you know, like I said, he'd kill us. So he sent us on another op and he told us, and and, and this made the, the stress even more because, um, you know, uh, we thought he did this on purpose. So there was a guy that... Um, we, he had told us to to uh, get into business with earlier 
a guy that ran the Cape Flats, and his name was Cyril Beaker. He was a very well-known guy in South Africa and the under in the underground and the underworld in South Africa. And the Cape Flats are like a, a dangerous area. A very dangerous area, yeah. And um, this guy basically ran a lot of the Cape Flats. He ran Cape Town for 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 many years. Um, uh, he was assassinated a few years ago um, on a drive-by with a, on the, the, the people that killed him were sitting on the back of a motorbike, drove past mm. him. I think they sh- riddled the car with uh, with a Uzi and uh, killed him. Um, his Serbian bodyguard at the time survived. But um, anyway, so Cyril um, was our dog handler. Uh, security partner. He would get us intel from the Cape Flats, etc. But um, so we were told to go and uh, do surveillance on on a guy that had just done seven years on Robben Island for for terrorism. Is that like an Alcatraz type pr- place? Exactly. Okay. Hundred percent. So Robben Island is the maximum security prison just off the coast of Cape Town, and it sits in the shadow of Table Mountain, which is in, in, in the city of Cape Town. Is it still a prison? Uh, it, it's a museum now. Oh, okay. Um, so uh, we went and, and did this um, surveillance operation in, in Cape Town in Seapoint, and uh, we were sitting across the road. We saw these two two guys, these two black guys sitting across the road, I remember uh, the one guy had a few fingers missing. There was a rumor that he lost these fingers uh, building bombs. Um, but, you know, these are very dangerous guys. Mm-hmm. Another guy, Andre Lincoln, was sitting there as well. And uh, all of a sudden, you know, they, they were sitting under this canopy of umbrellas, and then we saw this other guy walking towards them. And I recognized the gait of this guy and the um, body language of this guy. And as soon as he sat down and his head dropped from below the umbrellas, we saw it was Cyril, our partner. Dog our, handler, our, yeah. Our, our dog handler, our security, our, our muscle, our hitman on the Cape Flats. So, so he, he sat down with these two ANC terrorists. And we were like, what the fuck is Major Miller? Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Well, well, what is Major Miller doing here? Is he trying to set us up? Is he trying to get us killed? Is, does he know what's going on? Mm-hmm. Does he know what's happening? So now we need to get off the axe because if he makes us, well, we dead. He'll, he'll kill us. Cyril will. Cyril will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because he knows that we work for the security police. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. But he's working with... The ANC. The the enemy, your enemy at that time. Exactly. So, so you think Cyril knows that you guys... Oh, I see. So he he doesn't know that you know that he's your enemy. Exactly. Okay, right. Yeah. But if he sees you, then it, the jig is up. Exactly. And he'll shoot you or whatever. Exactly. Yeah, yeah and he... You know, if if... Your listeners know any South Africans, and you know you they aren't they can ask anybody about Cyril Beaker. He was one of the most notorious uh, and dangerous people from South Africa. So you know we had to get off the X. We got out of there. Um, you know we we didn't panic. Um, you know, but we realized that you know this is. This is a very, very dangerous game we're mm-hmm. playing now. You know, do we just get the hell out of there and go to England or, you know, come to the States or, you know, just just is it too hot? But, you know, we wanted to sit it out for a while. So then uh, Stephen Kamala calls us and he says, okay, we need you to go, come and meet your new comrades and your new handlers in the ANC. And we said, okay, fine. Wonder who it's going to be. So we go to a wimpy bar, a wimpy restaurant. Is that like a wimp is burger place? Yeah. I think we have that here. Yeah, wimpy burger. I think so. Yeah. yeah. It's like a little burger joint. As soon as we get to the burger joint and we're about to walk through the door, I see those two ANC terrorists sitting at the table. <laughs> I pull my nine mole 
And um, um, Stephen Kamala says, no, those are your comrades. Those are your new commanders. Mm-hmm. I was terrified. I thought this was uh, a uh, setup and, you know, we were going to get taken out. Yikes. So we sat at the table and um, obviously there was massive mistrust between all of us. Yeah. You know, these guys, Jeremy had just done seven years hard time on Robben Island um, with, uh, in, with Nelson Mandela, but Nelson Mandela was now in a different prison. Mandela hasn't been released yet at this stage. Oh, okay, still not out. Okay. Yeah, sorry. At this stage, Mandela was not out yet. And um, so what ended up happening was is that, you know, we knew that we had to build trust with these guys. And now it was crisis time because, uh, I beg your pardon, Mandela was He was out. Okay, was I was going to say, you wrote the no, book wrong, but I'm no, going to no, tell no, you no, that No, 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 no. Okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, yeah, my bad. He, 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 he was out already. Got it. And... Uh, you know, there there was uh, a sense that the African National Congress was going to come into power and that the political landscape in South Africa was going to change. Mm-hmm. So the ANC's Department of Intelligence and Security, DIS, under Mkonto Wesis, where the Spear of the Nation, the military wing, that's who we fell under now. So now we were double agents working for Mandela's spy team. And their biggest priority right now was to try and figure out um, what they're doing from a crisis damage control point of view. At the same time, Major Miller is also sending us to go clean up and do damage control because... Uh, there was a guy called Eugene de Kock who had a play, they call him Prime Evil. He was part of another uh, security police intelligence uh, a unit similar to Project Group that was on a place called Flockplass where the Lucerne, the grass grew, grew this high because of the dismembered um, body parts that they used to uh, plow into the fields. Yes. A uh, very brutal um, guy and operational team. We had to go and take care of one of Eugene de Kock's guys uh, because he was starting to speak to the Americans. And Miller heard about this, spoke to de Kock. So it was chaos within the intelligence community at that time. So stage. these like units are killing each other all the time. It, it, people are starting to panic. They're trying to sell stuff. They're trying to figure out... Can we move to the United States? Can we go here? Can we go there? Because the United States and their Nazi movement here were helping fund a lot of the organizations like World Apartheid Movement, WAM, etc. So, you know, there were uh, alliances all over the place. Crazy. What a mess. But there was, and, and this is what we call the dirty war. So this is what I refer to in the book as the dirty war. And, um, where we needed to go in and clean up. And and one of the things they wanted us to do was get all and every bit of intel that we could from Major Miller's office. So Major Miller was also a bit of a piss cat. He loved to drink. And, uh, you know, he had the special draw and he had this bottle in his draw. And, uh, you know, I happened to see where he hit a key once. And uh, we managed to break into his office, get this key, and get into this filing cabinet. Okay. We get into this filing cabinet, and we find a dossier within this filing cabinet of who are the African National Congress, Mandela's top guys that are assets of the National Party government. So you find out other spies. So we find out who the double agents are within the ANC. So we take this file and we make copies of it. We get out of there and um, we go and we start looking through this file. But this, the head of 
He claims he's the head of military intelligence for the African National Congress, but he's not the head of military intelligence, but he's a high-ranking mm. official within the African National Congress. This is going to put everybody's lives at danger and everybody at risk. And um, so um, that bought us a, a, a massive amount of um, a trust and friendship with our two new handlers within the ANC. Because you just had, you struck gold. We literally struck gold. but Figuratively, literally. <laughs> it, it, figuratively, <laughs> exactly. And, um, you know, so, uh, but now the, this intel is incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. and incredibly harmful. And, um, yeah, my, my publishers wanted to leave this part out of the book. Okay. Uh, but it's, it's very important for me to say this at the precipice of where we are as a nation, South Africa today, because one of the people that's name was on this list was Jacob Zuma, the former president of South Africa, who was within the intelligence community in the South African revolution. He was an Ascari, an Mpimpi, a double agent. Really? And um, the reason South Africa is burning today is because of him. So the world needs to know that this man had sold his people out a long, long time ago already. He's a charmer. He's incredibly charismatic. He's a uh, um, um, he's a brilliant strategist, and um, he became a president in South Africa. Mm -hmm. But you know, it's it's sad for me all these years later to to sort of see what happened in 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 this this revolution of these freedom fighters in South Africa because all these years later we see that the dream that Madiba had, that Nelson Mandela had of a free and fair society where we treat each other with dignity is, is not where we are in South Africa today. And that is because of the likes of Jacob Zuma and the damage he has created in the country. It's it, but if you found out that he was a double agent, how did he end up not getting arrested or getting the boot out of the ANC? Like if if there it, were documents say, hey, this guy's a double agent, how come he made it this far? Because Jeremy Beery and Andre Lincoln gave this intelligence to our intelligence head, which was Commander Comrade uh, Jonah Klala. Um, who's unfortunately passed on now, but um, they decided at that stage it was best to to not let anybody know about this. Oh man, this. what a friggin! Mess. I know. So it's a massive failure with with within the use of effective and uh, um, actionable intelligence, mm -hmm. and uh, South Africa is burning today because of this. So that's one of the reasons why um, I want to go back to my country. And that's one of the reasons why I want to go stand side by side with General Jeremy Vieri and Andre Lincoln and Neil De Beer and their fight against corruption and their fight against state capture in South Africa. Because this is not what the Freedom Charter set out for us and said it was going to set out for us. These guys were at the tip of the spear of the Asagai, fighting for people's fundamental human rights. The likes of Chris Harney, Al Che Guevara, mm -hmm. were so important to fighting uh, for our people. And yet, um, these people were all pushed to the side 
and uh, the light of Jacob Zuma came in and uh, um, turned our country upside down, mm -hmm. has promoted corruption, has uh, been involved in, in, in cronyism and tenders and... Uh, tenders? T tenders meaning uh, a government tenders giving uh, massive government contracts to friends, oh, families, sure. okay. and other corrupt uh, uh, people within within the party. So this beautiful dream that we had of a rainbow nation, you know, this beautiful kumbaya moment, if, if you've seen Invictus of mm -hmm. Morgan Freeman playing Mandela, and it's this great energy behind... This is the hopes and the dreams which the Israeli-Palestinian uh, conflict can can aspire to, you know, uh, was completely destroyed by the likes of, of Jacob Zuma, who has now gone and destroyed our country. So it's, it's yeah, the world needs to know about it. Definitely. I mean, you say comrade and, and, and things like that. Are, are you, would you describe yourself as a communist or a socialist? No, but that's, that, that's, I, I, I have a socialist ideals uh, from the point of view of, I'm, I'm more like a Bernie Sanders uh, uh, type of okay. um, gotcha. uh, ideals where, you know, I want to place humanity first. A more of a Trotskyan ideal where, you know, it would have worked out better for the people of South Africa that were um, uh, um, treated so badly for hundreds and hundreds of years to at least give them a fair step up, uh, giving them medical, giving them ho a housing, uh, giving them food, you know, just just basic fundamental rights. I'm not saying that, you know, we need to take, make the Reserve Bank uh, um, a parastatal, for instance. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that that uh, um, uh, uh, communist or socialist ideals work 100%, but there are elements um, to them where it serves humanity in a good mm -hmm. way. What do you think about this? These farm seizures, where they're sort of taking away the land from the white farmers, and I, I don't know, what are they giving it, redistributing it? So, so um, and, sure, you're asking the good questions, yeah. Jordan, because because <laughs> those are um, uh, um, really good questions, mm -hmm. and um, you know, it's 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 a very complicated dynamic because sure the uh, Dutch settlers came in and um, um, started farming and taking land, uh, taking land to farm, etc., and finding opportunities, etc. But um, the wrong people are fighting today and wanting to get that land back because the land belonged to the uh, Khoisan people, the Khrikwa people, mm -hmm. the indigenous people of South Africa. The other tribes, you know, came from different places uh, um, across Africa and migrated down south. You know, so it's it's it's. I I I'm just really disappointed in how our beloved ANC, which I'm still a member of to this day, has has let our people down mm -hmm. and let the people of South Africa down because. Um, you know these these guys that were on the ground fighting for our freedoms were, like I said, pushed aside. And the people that were in exile, eating lobster and caviar in London and raising money and doing good stuff, mm -hmm. but just came to back to South Africa, and uh, we're so used to that lavish lifestyle, and um, you know have have placed their needs before the needs of of our the poorest of people in South Africa. Uh, I need to just touch on how do these land seizures, et cetera, work and farm murders work, et cetera. And it's, it's, this is a very personal thing to me mm -hmm. because when 
I was in South Africa with um, with Annie Kostner and Adrian Hall, who are um, documentary filmmakers, documenting my my story. Um, my brother in law was murdered on our family farm, and um, I, I made this little video afterwards and I showed this video of our beautiful farm and I said, this is a beautiful country, our beloved South Africa, but the reality is that our ANC government has failed to protect our people. And they really have. So now it's time that uh, we really need to go and get control of the situation. Uh, we need to make sure that our police protect our citizens. We need to make sure that our national security capabilities are um, are of standard and, um, you know, so that we can protect our people, mm -hmm. so that we can protect our tourists when they come to mm -hmm. the country. Because I would love to go to South Africa, but I'm also like, is this a good idea? You know, yeah. but I, I'm a little bit more gutsy than my pregnant wife, obviously. Yeah. But it's like, it looks amazing. My friends tell me it's amazing. Even the non-South Africans, the ones that go on their tour. But I'm like, you know, they got beaches and places that don't have riots right now. Yeah, too. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, um, you know, uh, p people have have said to me, oh, you, why would you take your family? Why would you go move back to this country? Right. This precipice when this country's on fire and it's burning currently. Um, in certain regions, for instance, KwaZulu Natal mm -hmm. and uh, Gauteng, which is near the capital, and um, you know, it's it's because of the instigations by Jacob Zuma and um, and um, people within um, the captured side of the African National mm -hmm. Congress. So there's still hope for South Africa, but, uh, you know, we need to go and, um, we need to go and fix it. So. Shout out to our listeners. We have listeners in KwaZulu-Natal and Gauteng, or Gauteng, because I see it on there and I've, uh, on our downloads, and I'm always like, oh, where are these places? You know, who's yeah. who's listening to us in these places? Cape uh, Town, yeah, yeah sure. Cape Town yeah. for sure, yeah, yeah, Joburg yeah. for sure, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I don't know about these those other places I'd never heard of. Um, all right, so I want to get back to the story because there's there's even more interesting stuff here the, the, before we wrap. But you come back, you're copying these documents, you find these intelligence documents, and you come across a binder full of all the, basically all the bad shit you guys did, but none of the police cover, right? So they were going to set you up, it sounds like. Correct. So, you know, it, in essence, what we think Major Miller was doing was um, uh, keeping this as his ace up his sleeve in case mm -hmm. things went tits up and he needed to throw us under the bus. And, you know, in, in, any uh, uh, brilliant strategist in the intelligence uh, uh, arena would use this form of tradecraft. So. Yeah. Yeah, it, but it was really concerning. But, you know, we managed to um, um, take it uh, and replace it with pages from a telephone book. And um, Do you think he noticed? Uh, eventually he did. And, and you know, I think that's, that's when, you know, ultimately we were chased out of the country and they try to kill us. So, yeah. Well, we'll get there in a second. So the, the ANC takes over, Mandela's inaugurated. Now your ANC friends who used to be state enemies are promoted or installed in the security apparatus, which must have been a mess, right? Because you got these apartheid old guard and then in the office down the hall, you've got the guy they were chasing for 20 years who came back from Zambia or London or whatever. And they're in the same office on the same floor sharing a secretary. That just... I don't understand how that would have worked. That's got to be fairly complex. But your intelligence leads to foiling an assassination plot. So actually, that's before the inauguration, yes. So um, what Major Miller instructed us to do was to take the, the that cache of weapons mm -hmm. that we have found and give it to WAM, World Apartheid Movement, you know, which is, again, the uh, unit that is used uh, for political assassinations and killings, etc. Um, we go back to our handlers, uh, uh, Stephen Kumalo, um, uh, Jeremy Vieri, and Andre Lincoln, and ultimately they went to Jonah Klala, 
and told them that, you know, this is the instructions, what should we do? Because I was terrified now because, you know, these are going to go from somebody else to somebody else who's probably even more evil. You know, these guys were doing it for liberation and for for freedom, these people are just doing it for complete mm -hmm. hatred and, and they had an evil agenda. Um, not that I'm justifying shooting a plane out of a, a, a sky, but, you know, the... Um, so the, we came up with a, a plan to uh, um, secretly mark certain weapons that we would hand, hand over to them that would work. The others we kept aside. We had removed the firing pins. We had uh, uh, disassembled a lot of the uh, uh, components of it. And um, so they told us to take it up to this farm in Zierest, which is in this... Uh, uh, What's a Zierest? Like a farm? Z uh, sorry, Zierest is a, a, a town, a farming community in okay. a beautiful Citrus Valley. And um, this is where... Uh, uh, Chris Vermeil and the head of Wham, uh, uh, um, operated out of, and uh, you know he had this beautiful German Shepherd that he named Blondie after how uh, after um, Adolf Hitler's dog, okay. and uh, you know weird fanboys. Yeah, exactly. These guys were uh, radicalized right wing militant mm -hmm. guys, mm -hmm. and. Um, that operated with with uh, the likes of the Aster Brigada, which is the Iron Brigade of of the AWB, and uh, so we hand these weapons over to them, etc. Um, you know they like me. We get on very well. There's a guy um, that was there, a guy by the name of um, uh, Keith Keith Conway, um, who I actually knew uh, previously. Um, and he knew of me because of the security work in the Cape and, you know, the, uh, um, the cloak, uh, well, the thuggery, et cetera, mm -hmm. of project group. And, um, uh, what he, so, so Keith and I got on very well. Quest for Merlin, who Keith worked for put a bug in his ear and said, hey, Bradley's a great asset. Why don't we use him? Mm -hmm. So that's how I en ended up um, infiltrating the world apartheid movement. And I ended up staying with them for about two years. Jeez. And uh, during that time, uh, no, sorry, uh, it, just over a year rather. So, so basically you're a, th a thug who's undercover with the security branch police, who's also undercover as a double agent with the DIS, who's now an undercover agent with the World Apartheid Movement. Well, they asked me to infiltrate the World right. Apartheid Movement. Right, right. But I'm just saying you have like yeah. three covers. Yeah. It, 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 you know, it was a nightmare. Yeah. It, you know, it was incredibly stressful. And, um, you know, but um, I also thrived on it. I, th I thrived on the rush of, mm -hmm. of the danger and... Um, um, it was, um, it was a very stressful time, like I said, but you know, uh, it was, I'm, I'm glad I was there because, um, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, we found out about the poisoning plot for the uh, township mm -hmm. and, uh, we managed to avoid that happening. Um, then, uh, you know, we found out that the, um, um, just by chance that they were building a homemade rifle, sniper's rifle. I didn't know what it was for initially, but um, my mother had given me this Walkman cassette player and I used to lis listen to my classical music or opera, or whatever. I used to love all different types of music. But what I'd use that cassette for was uh, I'd let the music play and then I would tape my field notes into the uh, um, recording of the tape recorder. For instance, say they're building a rifle, they're planning a uh, assassination. I don't know who it is yet. And then I'd put it in a dead drop. At that stage, Cyril Beaker was across the uh, um, border in uh, uh, Bot uh, Botswana, which is a different African country, right next to uh, South Africa. 
And he'd come across the border and at, in the middle of the night, grab the cassette and they would go and play the cassette. And that's how it filled them in. Ah. I ended up did f finding out that they were planning to assassinate Mandela at his inauguration. Wow. Yeah. So I gave that intel to um, Andre Lincoln. And Andre Lincoln and Jeremy Vieri, uh, with our team, managed to thwart the assassination of Mandela at, at his inauguration. Wow. How did they do that? Just by... Did they... Oh, no, it was a uh, hunt down to the minute. You know, they found this, this sniper rifle in the security police policeman's desk. He was in the government security police, and um, he had credentials to go to the inauguration and um that's that's why we had that uh uh, uh ballistic uh bulletproof glass around madiba around mandela at his inauguration yeah i mean you would have to uh that's that's wild what that's a very close call yeah no it <laughs> it's and uh but pretty much after that um i got a encrypted uh, well a well, we call it encrypted just because, um, you know, I got a covert message that mm -hmm. I needed to go and meet with um, Andre Lincoln. Right. And um, just like you said, he was now a brigadier in the South African police. He was appointed personally by Nelson Mandela. And um, um, he told me that Andy Miller, Major Miller, had found out that it was us that have sabotaged a few of these projects and um, that they wanted to take us out and that they had actually got the young Americans, which is a gang, which is a ga notorious, very dangerous gang out of Polesmore prison, which is the maximum security prison in Cape Town, um, to put a hit out on us, on myself and Neil De Beer. Mm -hmm. So Neil De Beer and I were, you know, in the crosshairs now and we had to get get out of there. And the ANC helped us um, get out of the country yeah. and well, go into exile. So while these other comrades were coming back from all these uh, places in New York and London and Oslo, et cetera, we were passing each other like ships. They were coming back from exile and, we just had to get the hell out of there. I think it's an interesting note that the most dangerous people in one of the most dangerous countries during the most dangerous time are called the Americans. I'm just going to leave that there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Like, yeah. Who's, who's the most dangerous person yeah. in South Africa? Well, oh, these Americans. Well, there's another gang as well, and they're called the Sexy Boys. You know, That's a ridiculous the, name for exactly. people. Exactly. Yeah. No, but it's, it's insane. It's... Oh. Brand, they got a branding issue. YouTube uh, Cape Flats gangsters. Yeah, <laughs> you'll I, see all these characters. I will definitely do that. So, last five minutes here. How did you? You almost got killed on the way out of the country. Yeah. I mean, it's like this is like the part of the movie that's the most exciting chase scene, and you know. Yeah. Well, when I saw the guy uh, pull up next to us and smiling, and I saw he he's grilled with his with his teeth, and the next thing I saw, a uh, Desert Eagle uh, pistol, uh, pistol mm -hmm. glimpse out of the corner of my eye. I thought, that's a tickets, we're dead. Mm -hmm. uh, these guys were going to kill us, but it was, uh, and then I couldn't get my gun. My gun was stuck in my holster mm -hmm. uh, because I didn't have a combat uh, uh, hammer on my, my pistol <laughs> instead of... So the hammer got snagged. The ha hammer got snagged. And, uh, yeah, I uh, saw my life flash by me a few times, but, um, yeah. And, um, but, you know, w one thing I do want to say, Jordan, is that, um, you know, in, in my business or in my former business, um, um, you know, we don't talk about tradecraft. We don't talk about secrets. We don't talk about this stuff, um, because there's a silent oath that we take as intelligence professionals, uh, and we don't talk about this stuff. But uh, this, the story of of these brave heroes, uh, the likes of Jeremy Vieri and Andre Lincoln, is is 
the main reason why I decided to write this book and tell this story was because these guys are the un unsung heroes of the liberation movement in South Africa. And today they're being marginalized and um, thrown to the wolves. Major General Vieri is a... Um, uh, uh, was a major general in the South African police up until a week ago. But because he's uncovering uh, massive amounts of uh, corruption within the South African government, as has uh, Andre Lincoln, they, the, the captured corrupt part of the ANC are so scared of them that, that they're just getting rid of them and, and throwing them under the bus. So... When you made it out of South Africa, there's a kind of an exciting scene in the book, and I'll let people maybe read the book to get this, but you basically run into a pub and escape by boat, which is, and then you end up getting smuggled into Swaziland, which is this like weird landlocked country and, and the, on your way out. I mean, it's just, the whole thing reads like a spy novel in many ways, and I'm excited to see what you end up doing with it. So you're moving back there, which should be interesting. Uh, gutsy move, man. Very pedestrian life you've lived. You might want to try breaking the mold sometime, you know? Yeah, maybe I should... Uh, Not a lot of excitement. Yeah, maybe I should uh, move up, uh, rather move up here to the Bay Area and get a techie job or something. Yeah. No. Well, there's plenty of action around here now, unfortunately, as well. Yeah. Not quite like South Africa, but yeah. thank you so much yeah, for yeah. coming on the show, man, and telling your story. Absolutely. You know, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm just uh, blessed to uh, um, be in this situation, to be able to tell the story. And, um, you know, like I said, this is about putting humanity first and uh, learning from our mistakes. Um, you know, um, it's, it's very, very important that, um, you know, the United States, at it's, it's, it's this precipice that it is with the Black Lives Matter movement, um, that we learn from from history and 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 from the mistakes that have been made, and it's it's very important because what I've seen happen here in the United States in 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 the years that I've been here now, um, you know, is very reminiscent. Elements of it is very reminiscent of apartheid. Uh, um, security bureaucracy, if I could say that, from the police unions to the police forces and the way that they profile and handle black people, um, you know, is, is, it's, it's disgusting. So, you know, um, I don't know if you know, I was at a Black Lives Matter march and... Uh, yeah, you sent me a text telling me how you lost one of your... Well, so you, you're at a Black Lives Matter march and what what happened? <laughs> so I was going to take my daughter to a Black Lives Matter march, um, which happened uh, in two thousand and um, twenty, right? Yeah. Well, uh, just did you have a mask on? That's the question, right? Because yes, not, I did have a mask. Okay. Yeah. So in two thousand and twenty, I went to the Los Angeles Black Lives Matter march. I was going to take my daughter because I said to her. It's very important, you know, that we fight racism um, because we had just seen what happened to George Floyd and him getting the life squeezed out of him. So it, we were making posters, and then at the very last minute, something in my gut said, don't take your kid. Mm -hmm. I ended up going to Black Li the, this Black Lives Matter march at Fairfax and uh, Third near the Grove in L.A., and um, I basically uh, uh, witnessed the um, a guy called Cedric Sampson, who's the organizer in L.A., uh, getting the life beat out of him. He got beat up, and uh, it just agitated the whole crowd. Mm -hmm. The LAPD just started beating up people. And I was standing there was trying to reason with them, saying, calm down, you know, just relax, you know, this is excessive. You guys don't have to be so violent. They were literally beating the hell out of people. And I can send you a clip and show you. And um, what ended up happening is a, a, this la a black lady fell over and fell into this hedge in the Trader Park's 
a Trader Joe's parking lot and they just started beating her up and climbing into her with batons. I couldn't stomach it anymore, so I went in and I picked her up and I lifted her over a hedge and some other people pulled her over the hedge. I turned around and then I got hit over the chest. Uh, so I went back into the crowd and then it calmed down a little bit and then I saw another chap walking by, black guy, again, and he was on his cell phone. He had a big straw hat and he was just walking by and they just started beating the hell out of him mm. for no reason at all. I leant forward, uh, I lunged forward and um, I ended up getting shot with a rubber bullet and I got shot in, in the genitalia and mm. I ended up um, getting rushed to see the cyanide and I ended up losing 45% of my left testicle. Jeez, good thing you already have your kids. Exactly. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but um, that's nasty. Mm. What, what what good is half a testicle though? Why not just take the whole thing out? Yeah, well, they had to. You know, it it had ruptured. The nerve endings were sticking out, Oof. so they had to fuse the nerve endings, and then suture my testicle, and then suture up my scrotum. So good God. So how about we leave leave it at that? Who's hungry? I'm hungry. You want to yeah, get some lunch? Yeah. Let's get some lunch. Let's go get some matzo balls. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this entire episode of The Jordan Harbinger Show. If you're interested in exploring this topic further, check out The Jordan Harbinger Show podcast feed. There, we dive even deeper on this and many other topics. In the audio podcast, I also close open loops, cover things discussed off camera, off air, and give some parting lessons from our guest. You can find The Jordan Harbinger Show in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, any podcast app, or at jordanharbinger.com. And also, if you found this episode useful, please share it with those you care about. Last but not least, like, comment, and subscribe.